48 chefs from across the UK are putting their reputations on the line in a bid to become professional MasterChef champion. Six more hopefuls are competing to impress. Judge Greg Wallace, renowned chef Monica Galletti, and Michelin starred Marcus Waring. I can't wait to show the judges and the whole country what I can do. Oh, this is the biggest thing that I've done in my career, so it would mean a lot to me to do well. These opportunities don't come around very often, so I'm just going to give it my all. I can't wait to see what talent is about to walk through those doors. This is a massive opportunity for these six chefs. We have six new chefs to meet, six brand new contestants. First off, they've got to face a skills test. Marcus, what are you going to ask them to do? I would like them to cook a monkfish tail on the bone, serve it with a vermouth cream sauce and a garnish of broccoli. How long did they have? 20 minutes. Oh, we're in for an absolute treat here. Show us how it's done. All righty. First job is the monkfish. We've got to get that prepped, ready to go, and in the pan, move sort of the side flaps there first. Taking the skin off a monkfish is a little bit different to skinning a normal fish. This one, you can just pretty much just tear it off. What are you taking off there, Marcus? So this is a sinew, or the membrane that sits just underneath the skin. If you don't remove it, once this goes into the pan and cooks, it gets tighter and tighter and tighter, and it tightens the fish up. So by removing it, allows the flesh of the fish to just relax. So that's what I'm looking for. Nicely trimmed up, nice portion size. Beautiful. And what we want to do is just get that sealed on the outside. What's the advantage of cooking it on the boat? It protects the inner side of the fish. It keeps the flavour in and it adds flavour into the flesh. And then it keeps the, the moisture and, and the fish from drying out when you do it on the boat. The chef's intuition is going to have to come into the equation with cooking this fish. That fish is undercooked, it's not going to come away from the bone at all. Overcooked, it's best with monkfish, it's going to be incredibly dry. I'm just going to wrap the, the fish in butter paper so that it just protects it and steams the fish while it's on the top of the stove. It doesn't go in the oven? It's all cooked in the pan? It can go in the oven. I'm just going to cook it in the pan here. So, now for the sauce. And what you want to do with the shallots is just sweat them down. I'm just going to put a few little sliced button mushrooms in there. I'm just going to put a, a sprig of tarragon, and that's there just to incorporate flavour during the cooking process. So what we're going to do now is just deglaze the pan with a little bit of um, vermouth. A vermouth sauce with the fish is, is a classic. You can now smell the sort of the aniseed flavour coming out of the tarragon and the vermouth. A little bit of fish stock. Just waiting for the fish stock to come down now. And so I just want them to serve it with some purple sprouts and broccoli. And they can do this any way they like. I'm just going to just very gently pan fry it. But I'm just looking for really just a little bit of vegetable cookery that works very well with the dish. So the fish stock's come down. I'm just going to have a touch of cream. And I also like a touch of creme fraiche. Consistency of the sauce for me is really important because you want it to coat the fish once you're starting to eat it. You don't want it to be something completely separate. So just finish your sauce with your tarragon, the knob of butter, just to enrich in the sauce. Why not? I'm not going to complain. Just taking the fish off the butter paper. So what you have here is you've got the butter and a little bit of moisture has come out of the fish and it's just created this lovely basting sauce. Mm. Look at that. Oh, wonderful. And there we have it. Monkfish cooked on the bone, vermouth cream sauce and broccoli. Very, very smart. I think it looks amazing, but, you know, you make it look very easy, Marcus. You know, I hope our chefs know how to make a great vermouth sauce and cook the fish on the bone. The yeah. broccoli, that has to be treated with respect. First up is Brazilian-born George who works as a head chef at an embassy in London. 
My main job is to look after the functions. Could be lunch, could be a gala dinner sometimes. I love being a chef. Busy kitchen, people preparing things. The level of stress, all this build up adrenaline. And it's, it's a bit weird, but it, it's, it's how chefs get the fix. I'm 49 years old. Probably I'm the grandpa of the competition. But I'm definitely as hungry as the youngsters, believe me. Okay, George, I would like you to prepare the monkfish, cook it on the bone, serve it with vermouth cream sauce and a broccoli garnish. Okay. You've got 20 minutes, George. Off you go. George, do you cook monkfish in your place of work? I have, yes, every now and again. What's the plan with the fish? I'm going to seal the outside, stick in the oven. Did you prepare or eat much fish growing up? Absolutely, absolutely. I'm, I'm from the north of Brazil, the Amazonian region, so I grew up with a river just in the, in the backyard. You're halfway, George. Halfway? Yeah, 10 minutes left. Now I'm going to do mushroom, tarragon, lemon zest and a vermouth creamy reduction. Fantastic. Need to reduce a little. You've got five minutes left, George. Are, are, you, are you happy with how things are going? It's about you being happy, not me. Okay, you're done. Well done, thank you. Thank you. George, when you took the skin off the monkfish, you then need to remove the membrane and cut off all of the little fins here. You don't want those on a plate. People don't like to eat that. Your broccoli looks a little bit sad, maybe overcooked because you've just boiled it. I think that could just do with another minute or two in the oven. You're okay. You're just about there. Just. The sauce making, I like the way you were doing it. The layers of flavors are sort of just there, but the consistency of the sauce, you can see here, it's a bit of a puddle. Not bad, George. I'd like the fish cooked a little bit more, but if that was served to me, I wouldn't send it back. I think the broccoli here for you is a bit of an afterthought. It could have done with a little bit more care. George, there's another round to come. See you soon. Thank you, Thank George. You. I'm annoyed and I'll punch myself now. It was just timing and maybe the nerves got the best of me, but I will come back strong on the next round. Originally from the Philippines, 23-year-old chef de partie Lorena currently works at a bistro in Belfast. I grew up in a farm surrounded by rice fields, pigs, ducks, cows. All we had to do is just pick the vegetables and then just cook it there and right then and eat it right then. I first came here in Northern Ireland when I was 15. My mom met my stepfather, and my stepfather treated me like his own daughter. Cooking and eating is a way of communicating and socializing. Whether you have your own language or a different kind of culture, when it comes to food, everybody understands what you're talking about. You all right? Nervous. <laughs> Are you? Yeah. Cooked a whole monkfish before? Nope. Have you prepped one? Um, nope. Have you seen one? I have seen one. Let's just start. OK, 20 minutes, off you go.
Well done. I'm just taking this um, inner skin off and then I'm gonna sear it in the pan. That's it. We're on the way. What's, what are you thinking? What, what's confusing you? I'm just thinking to do for um, the sauce. So it's a vermouth cream sauce. Do you know what vermouth is? Um, no, not really. It's that. Oh, OK. Taste a wee bit, if that's OK. <laughs> You're right. Strong for me, so it is. Right. Fish is in. You're halfway, so you've got ten minutes left. Oh. So in the pan, you've got shallots, vermouth that you've reduced, and half a pint of cream. Yep. I'm just going to let that reduce. Just over three minutes. And how are you going to cook the broccoli? Um, just like sear it. Where's that going? Uh, just in the oven, just a bit undercooked. So I'm just going to let. You've that got thirty in. seconds. Yep. <laughs> we got we've got to get it on a plate. We haven't got any more time. Sorry. You're okay. Finished? Finished. <laughs> Couple of seconds over. We'll forgive you. Yeah. <laughs> Lorena, you didn't know how to prepare a monkfish and you removed all of the outer skin, but you still left some of that membrane on there. But I really like the way you took your time and found your way through it. Ooh. A little rare up this end, cooked up that end. Some of that flesh is just beautiful. Some of it's a little bit under, but I love the fact you've basted it in butter. I think the way you've cooked the broccoli is lovely. It has got good seasoning on it. It's still got a, a crunch to it. With your sauce, I, I like the amount of vermouth you, you put in there, but then you put in the whole lot of cream, which diluted everything. I think you, you muddled your way through it, I think. The fish cookery could be better, the preparation could be better, but you've just about got it cooked, just about. OK. Lorena, the toughest bit is over. Thank you very Thank much. You. My brain just like, oh, what do I do? It's just a bit chaos inside my brain, like a hamster, you know, <laughs> going round and round. Last to face Marcus's test is 35-year-old executive chef Abinda, who has been cooking for 15 years. Currently, I'm working for one of the biggest wedding catering company, which generally caters for the Asian weddings. Being a Punjabi, the bringing of the food and the cooking of the food and eating, it's, it's in our blood. I've worked in Mumbai for, you know, six years. Then I came over to UK and then I changed my cuisine into more of French and European. So it's a mix of Indian and French influences. The reason I'm entering this competition is more about accepting the challenge, go for it, and always ready for something unexpected which is gonna come my way. Abinda, we're gonna give you 20 minutes. Yeah. Off you go. So what have you removed? I've just removed uh, the skin of it and the fins of it. I'm just going to remove the membrane so, you know, it uh, doesn't stiffen it up. So now the fish is in the pan, uh, what are you going to do with it? Uh, I'm just going to sear it up on uh, both the sides, then uh, put it in the oven. So I'm just going to start off with the sauce. I'm just going to use shallots, uh, charagan mushroom, uh, just toss it up in, uh, in the butter. Got any hobbies? I uh, play a lot of cricket. Are you any good at cricket? Very good, yeah. I used to play for Punjab. Did you? Under 16 level. Opening batsman. Brilliant. 
You got six minutes, chef. That's fine. I'm just gonna reduce the sauce. Thirty seconds, please. All done? Yep. Just in time. Yeah. Thank you. Abinda, I like the way you started, trimming away the, the fins and removing the outer skin and some of the sinew or the, or the membrane. It was a good start. I like the cooking of the fish. I think you did a good job with that. And I really love the fact that you, you got the butter and you're basting it. And that's added some fabulous flavour. The tender stem broccoli is nicely cooked, it's nicely seasoned. The sauce, you've got your proportions in the pan wrong. You've got too much liquid, too much cream, and it took a long time for it to come down. But it's not a bad attempt. This cream sauce is far too wet. If the fish was still alive, it, it could survive in that. But. Not a bad start, Chef. OK, look forward to seeing what else you can do. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very happy uh, the way the first round has gone so far. But you can't relax at this point of time. You need to go for it and you need to focus on what you're going to do. Right, we've had three chefs, Marcus, attempt your skills test. We have three chefs waiting, Monica, to face yours. What are you going to get the chefs to do? I'm going to get our chefs to make a crepe souffle and serve it with a salt caramel sauce. I know what a crepe is. I know what a souffle is. What's a crepe souffle, please? A crepe souffle is, is, a, is a pancake or a crepe that's been filled with a souffle mix and baked. How long will you give them to do this? We're giving them 20 minutes. This sounds really complex to me. Come and then show me, please. So first thing I need to get done is the pancake. And it's a really simple one, you know, like, as you would at home. So flour, milk. Do you put an egg in as well? I do. I'm not measuring it out. I don't expect the chefs to need a recipe for a crepe. One of the first things you do learn as a kid, especially at home, is how to make pancakes. Who doesn't like pancake day? So nice, runny pancake mix, because you want this to be quite thin. The souffle base is very light and airy. Now, if this is going to be a heavy pancake, it's just going to, to ooze out everywhere. I bet they all do them thicker than that. No. Right, now I'm going to make the souffle mix. So whisk the egg whites up just to sort of a soft bake, and then I gradually add the caster sugar to it. What's the end result we're looking for? It's all right. <coughs> we're giving them the creme pat base, and we just need to incorporate the two. I've whisked up the creme patisserie mix just to smooth out any lumps that are in there, and then I add a little bit of the egg whites. And I beat out any lumps. And once I feel it's now a smooth mix, you then want to fold through the rest of the egg whites. So whisk the mix at the start, fold at the end? Yes. If you can see now, Greg, it's really light and airy. OK, if I was to use a whisk on this, you would lose all that air in your egg whites. I'm fascinated to know how these two things come together. Now, the folding and how they present this is completely up to them. You know, it doesn't have to look like this. And there we have it, ready to go in the oven. So will that puff up slightly? It will, it will. That will take three to four minutes, at the most five. For me, that's enough time for our chefs to make a quick caramel sauce. I have a pan here, simple caramel sauce, sugar, butter and cream. But I'm using salted butter to make it a salt caramel sauce. I am literally racing against the souffle. Well, you better be quick. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's my sauce done. That's a fast sauce. What's that, about a minute? A minute or two. Mm. Mm. Oh, wow. 
It's like a great big sweet edible seashell. And that is finished with my caramel sauce. There we have it. My crepe souffle with a salt caramel sauce. There's a huge amount to do here. There's a huge amount of skill. Everything's by eye. Let's get the chefs in. Fingers crossed, right? The first chef to face Monica's test is 27-year-old Sam, who has his own patisserie catering company based in Devon. My company, I started about two and a half years ago, whilst I was still in hotels and restaurants, but I wanted to just focus on the pastry side of it. I've always had an affinity for pastry. There's so much more precision which is required for desserts. My goal is to have a real French-style patisserie. Lovely rows of patisseries all laid out. That's the dream. If I were to get a dessert in the skills test, I would probably be more nervous, just in case I mess it up. That would be disastrous. What I would like you to do, Sam, is to make a crepe souffle served with a salt caramel sauce. Right. 20 minutes. Off you go. Thank you. So you're starting with the crepe mix? Crepe mix, yeah. Like you would at home, by eye? Yeah. Well, no, oh. I, don't, I don't really do by eye. I'm a pastry chef. I prefer doing things precisely. This should be relatively easy for you. In, in theory, um, I've got to say, I've never even heard of a crepe souffle, to be honest. Okay, chef, seven minutes gone. Wait. Okay, 13 minutes left. Thank you. So, you got your souffle mix ready. Yep. You, you're just watching your, your, your crepe now, right? Yep. Trying to get a bit of, bit of colour. So what, what shape are you going to make? I'm going for a square. I'm going for a square. Right, Sam, so yep. that, that's now going to cook in the oven and you've got six minutes yep. to make the sauce and serve it. Wait. How's that looking in the pan? How's that looking in the oven? Pans are good. Oven, slightly questionable. I don't like this at all. This is rubbish. All right, come on, let's have it out, chef. 30 seconds. Wait. All done? Yep. Sam, how was that? Uh, rather disastrous, to be honest. Pancake making, um, a lot of butter in there in such a small pan, so it was really hard for your mix to spread out to make a thin crepe. The souffle, there wasn't enough sugar, the egg whites weren't stiff enough, and the creme part outweighed the amount of egg whites you had in there, so it was going to be very heavy, it was going to drop. You've made a pancake and a very nice caramel sauce, but the main part of it, the souffle, just hasn't worked. We've still got a souffle mix. You've got to put it behind you, and you've got to really showcase what you're doing next, and I hope it's going to be a good one. OK, thank you. Just horrendous. Absolutely horrendous. It's a pancake and a souffle. It's not rocket science. Couldn't have been a worse start. Next is 27-year-old Stu. Hello. You all right, Stu? Hi. Yeah, good, thank you. Head chef of a fine dining restaurant in Birmingham. 
I'd say probably about my 14th birthday, I decided that I wanted to become a chef because of my mum's inability to cook. I started off working in pubs and hotels, you know, learning the ropes. Contacted a Michelin star restaurant in Birmingham. Ended up working there for three years, and that was kind of almost a finishing school for me. I'm in quite a fortunate position that I am a head chef and I've got my own style and I write my own menus. It's the feedback you get from people when they say, oh, that was amazing. That gives you that sense of warmth, that pride. Stu, 20 minutes. A crepe souffle, salt caramel sauce. Yep. Go for it. First steps, what are you going to be doing first? So I'm just whisking up the egg whites for the souffle. At the same time, a little bit of sugar in a separate pan, just to make the caramel. Started the crepe mix, equal quantities of eggs, milk and flour. Now the egg whites have slightly beaten, I'm just going to add in some sugar and just carry on to whisk them up to a peak. What's, what are you doing? I'm going to start again. There's too much colour on the uh, crepe. It's true, if you're starting again, you're going to have to be quick. Happy with the souffle mix? Yep, it's light. Just folding it in half and in the oven? Yep. Who close to you knows you're here, Stu? My partner, Tash, and my little boy, Jack. What did Tash say to you before you came here today? Try not to be nervous. <laughs> be yourself. Try not to swear. It's rising, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Righto. Fingers crossed. Right. 30 seconds. Let's get that on the plate. Let's get the sauce on it. Drizzle, drizzle. All done? All done. The souffle making, you needed more sugar and the egg whites weren't quite stiff enough. Mm. You said it was light enough, for me, it's not. And with the weight of that sauce, which should have been nicely drizzled on there, it's collapsed. The sauce is wonderful, by the way. Stu, the crepes, it was good to see you make them again. That, for me, is not a crepe, it's too eggy. There's not enough flour gone into this mix. And with the souffle mix itself, there's not enough sugar. So what I've got in my mouth is a lot of egg with a good sauce. However you went about it, which may not please the chefs, you've given me a nice thin crepe, a really good salted caramel sauce and a vanilla flavoured souffle inside. As a punter, I'm happy. Stu, we'll see you in the next round. And off Thank you go. You. Thank you. Obviously, I didn't do as well as I wanted to. I've let myself down a little bit with a couple of the basics. Moving forwards, I'm going to have to prove my technical skills and kind of show what I am capable of. Last in is 26-year-old Miranda, currently working as a chef de partie at a one Michelin star restaurant in London. I really like working in the Michelin kitchen. It pushes myself, the standards are so high. The best parts of being a chef have to be creating, having that freedom to express yourself through a dish is just beautiful. <laughs> I think the first time walking into the MasterChef kitchen will be nerve wracking, but hopefully I just hold myself together and produce something edible. <laughs> You have 20 minutes, Miranda. Me? Off you go, chef. What are you looking for when you make your crepe? 
just a smooth batter, something light, not too thick. You've made souffle before? Um, I've not done much souffles, no. <laughs> what inspired you to become a chef? Um, it would be cooking in school. We had to make a lasagna, and it was one of the best lasagnas, apparently, that was in the class. So from then, I was just like, OK, let's continue cooking, and it seems to have worked. <laughs> Right now, I'm not too sure if I'm doing the right thing. How do you think the souffle mix is meant to look? I believe it should be airy. <laughs> so what have you got in there? Melted butter in, in with the sugar? In with the sugar. Just going to melt that down and put some cream in. So add a little bit of water. Ninety seconds left, okay? All done? Yes, all finished. Well done. I like the way you made the parcel for the souffle, but you need to allow more room for that souffle to grow. The souffle mix itself is much too dense, not enough egg whites. The caramel sauce, wow, burnt butter added to sugar and then some water and adding cream to it. Well, it just looks bizarre. Look at it. Yeah. Um, this is not a salted caramel sauce. It's a bit of a mess, Miranda. It's not great. I've got a kind of scrambled egg affair inside a, a thick envelope of pancake. All I can say to you, Miranda, is sort of draw a line under it, come back and show us how good a chef that you are. Miranda, listen, it can only get better, right? See you in the next round. Every single mistake I could have possibly made, I believe I made. But I'm going to write that one off, come back with the signature. Listen, we are fully aware that many, many chefs struggle in the skills challenge, right? Mm. We've seen it many, many times. The three that did my skills test have got some serious ground to make up. But they do have that second opportunity, which is, is their dish. And let's hope, you know, they're good. Chefs, welcome to your signature round. I hope you've left your nerves behind and you should be excited about cooking for us your signature dish. That was a tough skills test round. You all now need to raise the bar, lift your chins up and really give this signature dish all your focus and attention. One hour and 15 minutes to produce a fantastic dish at the end of this, three of you will be going through to the next round. Let's cook. After my performance and skills test, I think I can bounce back if, you know, I, you know, I believe in myself and um, I'm pretty confident. The inspiration behind this dish is the experience that I've had in Belfast being a chef. It's all just bringing everything I've learned into one plate. My dish is a pigeon, roasted with a lot of um, varieties of beetroot, so 
puree, um, pickled, roasted, set mushroom as well with pigeon sauce. Why a pigeon? A lot of um, Northern Irish people use it a lot, so I kind of like learn from them. But I love the flavour of the pigeon as well. I like the sound of this dish. I would like the pigeon roasted, beautifully golden on the outside, and served pink. The pickled beetroot needs just the right amount of acidity. The beetroot puree has to be perfectly cooked and nice and smooth. And a roasted beetroot needs that lovely buttery roasted flavour. What we also want when we make a pigeon dish is a fabulous pigeon sauce. You've had 15 minutes, guys. 15 minutes gone. My food style is definitely fusion. Obviously, growing up in Birmingham, there's so many different cultures. You know, you're influenced by flavours that you wouldn't necessarily have in a typical kind of English style. Wow, you are seriously into your Asian flavours, aren't you? I am indeed. What are you cooking for us? Uh, so I'm cooking a roasted quail with comfy leg, Thai green hollandaise, Thai green chicken sauce, uh, yeast crumb, uh, coriander oil and chimichurri. Why this dish, Stu? This is something that I think really reflects my personality and my style of cooking. These are the flavours that really excite me in the kitchen. Boy, there is a lot going on in Stuart's dish. Really intrigued on how all these really strong flavours are going to come together, especially using something as delicate as a quail. I've never had a Thai green hollandaise before. I'm unsure of how this dish is going to look or be presented and which flavour is going to stand out from the other. The type of food that I like to cook is food that I grew up with, so a lot of Caribbean produce, but doing it in a modern British way with kind of Asian flavours. <laughs> Miranda's dish. This is interesting. Spiced chicken breast with plantain. We've got chicken thighs filled with chicken mousse. And we've also got some chicken wings that have been deboned halfway, stuffed with the chicken mousse, which are going to be dipped in tempura and deep fried. You have to be very careful with chicken mousses, that you don't split them, that they're not grainy, and that they're cooked all the way through. We've also got sweet potato puree, and there's also going to be a spiced chicken sauce with tarragon oil. There seems to be a lot of work here for Miranda. We're just going to make sure that the star of this plate, the chicken, is cooked perfectly. Who has sampled this dish? So this has been dinner for the last two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> I've got the mother's approval. So she's tried it, uh, put her input in on things that she's not too happy with and things she would change. Chefs, you have 30 minutes left, please. 30 minutes. I feel like I've got a lot to, uh, lot to do, considering how horrendous the uh, skill test was. I am very competitive, even over the smallest things. Even popping peas, I would make it a competition. I'm doing a roasted fillet of stone bass, and I'm serving it with a roasted celerat fondant, celerat puree, uh, an apple pom puree, an apple puree, braised celery, and then a side of celery actually. Sam, forgive me, your love is pastry. Yes. Right? Why would you not do something sweet? When I've done it for people, I've put it on in a restaurant, the customers liked it, my chefs liked it. I want to show that I have a variety of skills. Stone bass comes from the sea bass family. That's a great alternative, beautiful fish. Sam is going to pan fry it, so you want the skin crispy. Lovely and flaky when it's cooked, and we don't want him to dry it out. I'm a little bit concerned as to what is going to be the predominant flavour, and is that stone bass going to be camouflaged by all that apple and celery act? For my signature dish, I'm bringing to the judges Nikkei Cuisine. Nikkei Cuisine is the discipline of the Japanese cooking with South American ingredients without them clashing. It is innovative, it is different. There are ingredients and elements in it that probably they haven't seen before or haven't tasted before. So it is a big risk. 
George, what's your signature dish? I'm going to give you an Ike salmon tostada, which is a ceviche with South American chilies. And everything is going to rest on palm hearts. And I'm going to give you a Japanese broth, lemongrass and ginger dashi. Am I right that there is a huge Japanese influence in South America? Absolutely. Brazil has a, the biggest Japanese yes. community outside of Japan. So I'm very excited to show you guys this. I really am intrigued about this dish. A ceviche is a raw marinated fish, and the base of this is what is called a tiger's milk. The tiger's milk normally has a lot of chili and lime running through it, but George is using Amazonian chili. They pack some heat. Personally, I love it. A good dashi broth is a good, strong, fishy broth. Tastes delicious with a hint of lemongrass. It's got to carry this dish. It also needs to work with all the other elements. You have 20 minutes left. Abinda, you look very well organized. What are you cooking? I'm doing a Kerala spice macro, using a lot of spice from the southern part of India. So I'm serving that with a muli salad curry leaves, and it's going with a gooseberry chutney. Not a great deal of cooking. Not a great deal of cooking, but, but it's, it's all about, you know, balancing the flavor and balancing the spice, which is very difficult to balance it out. I love the spices uh, from South India. I love the curry leaves. I, like, I love the black pepper. So this dish is, you know, has got a very special place in my heart. It's going to be me on the plate. Abinda is just going to be warm in the mackerel under the salamander. So he's not going to pan fry it. It's been marinated and it's just going to gently warm through. He doesn't want to overcook it. It does sound simple, but it's all about the balance, the enjoyment of the flavors all working together. Pickled black muli, deep fried curry leaves just bring something very different to this dish. And it sounds exciting. It sounds like something I really want to try. You have five minutes, chefs, please. Last five minutes. Cooking of the quail has come out perfect. Last couple of bits on the plate and we're ready to go. Anything could be better than last round. You have one minute left. Time's up. Stop. Sam's signature dish is roasted stone bass. With a celeriac fondant, sautéed mushrooms, braised celery, a celeriac puree, an apple pom puree, and a parmesan and hazelnut crisp finished with a cider and celeriac jus. Sam, when I read your dish and I heard you talk about it, it just didn't sound right. Too many purees, too many combinations of things. But you've absolutely nailed the dish for me. I think it's sensational. The celeriac all the different ways you put it on the plate was just right in proportion. And the sauce is an absolute delight. That's a great dish. Well done, you. I think your stone bass is cooked wonderfully. It hasn't dried out and the skin is nice and crispy. I really like the texture and the taste of that hazelnut and a parmesan crisp on here. I think it's elegant, modern, very, very smart. Well done, chef. <laughs> wow. I couldn't believe it. Some of the comments. <laughs> George has made a salmon ceviche, served with an amaranth seed and nori tostada, with charred palm hearts and a lemongrass and ginger dashi. That is a strikingly pretty dish.
Georgia, I really like the way that you served your ceviche inside the tostada and the texture it brings. The salmon is beautifully cured. I really wish you put more of the chili through it. It's lovely, but it misses that kick off the chili. The palm hearts are, are very nicely presented and, and nicely scorched. I find the broth a little bit bland and doesn't have a lot of flavour to it. I've got very nice flavours, but they're subtle. I thought I was coming to dance a samba. I've actually ended up with a bit of a waltz. I think all the feedback they gave, it, it, could, it could be better. Uh, personally, I'm happy with what I produced. Lorena's signature dish is roast squab pigeon, served with roasted and pureed beetroot, Asian sep mushroom, and rainbow chard, finished with a pigeon sauce. Lorena, there's a few little points here that have concerned for me, and that's the rusticness of the way in which you're taking the pigeon off the bone. That needs to be a lot cleaner. And the pigeon is overcooked. The beetroot puree is beautiful and silky and smooth. That is very nice. The sep is beautifully cooked and got great flavour. I think it's seasoned really nicely, and you've got the crispiness on the skin. But the sauce, for me, is taking to a point where it's just been over-reduced, that it's almost too salty. I really, really like your flavours, but I wonder why I've got different textures of beetroot that are the same flavour. I actually pickled the rainbow beetroot, but it turned out to be too sweet, so I didn't put it on the plate. I see. Our binder's dish is Kerala spiced mackerel with a mooly salad, pickled black mooly, radish, compressed apple and sea vegetables, served with a black salt yogurt and gooseberry chutney. Wow. What an absolute magical mystery ride of different flavours and different textures. That mackerel, it starts off slightly smoky and then it finishes with a, a creeping heat, which I love. The bitterness in the mooly and saltiness is quite extraordinary. It makes you reach over for the gooseberry chutney to get some relief. I mean, it's a real up and down, spinning around journey of flavours, but beautiful flavours. The warmth of the chilies, the chutney that's got a heat to it, but also it's tangy. Then you've got the yogurt, which is also very soft and mellows everything down. I think it's absolutely brilliant. Thank you. The tartness of the gooseberry with the spices is delicious. I could take a whole jar of that, um, and I'd like the recipe as well. Well done, mate. Well done. Brilliant. There was no criticism, so I'm pretty, pretty happy for myself here. Stew's roasted quail breast is served with a confit quail leg, courgettes, maitake mushrooms, a yeast crumb, and a Thai green curry hollandaise, finished with a Thai chicken sauce split with chimichurri oil. Your flavours are a treat. Uh, your, your quail cookery is delicious. It's, it's just right. You've confit the legs beautifully well. I love your sauce. I think it's absolutely fabulous. I love the mushrooms. I love the courgettes. I would like to have tasted a little bit more of the Thai hollandaise. It sort of was a, was a decoration on the plate, but wasn't there for the eating, unfortunately. You've got good flavour and you've got good cookery. 
a little bit of sharpness in your sauce, most certainly coriander and salt, but not quite the majestic flavours of Thailand. I find the Thai influence, it's subtle, you know, just sitting in, in the flavours of, of the coriander in the background. The quail would have been lost if this Thai green curry was much stronger. Um, interesting ideas. You are intriguing. I feel good, you know, it was a much improved round from the skill test, so I'm happy. Finally, it's Miranda's signature dish. A spiced chicken breast topped with a plantain glaze and crispy chicken skin. Served with a mousse-filled chicken thigh, sweet potato puree, pickled sweet potato ribbons, a spicy tempura chicken wing filled with a chicken mousse and a scotch bonnet dipping sauce, finished with a spiced chicken curry sauce and tarragon oil. You've got some great flavours on here. I particularly like your crispy, really salty chicken skin across the breast. And I really love the sharpness that you've got in those sweet potato ribbons. Not a fan of the thigh. The skin is quite thick, so I'm getting a kind of unrendered fat chew that I, I don't like. Miranda, the chicken for me is quite moist, but I can't quite taste the plantain. I think there should have been a bit more of it uh, with that glaze. The thigh, it's let down by the filling inside, which I think is it's a bit grainy. Miranda, I like your dish. Um, I think you need a bit of work on your presentation and refinement. I think the chicken wing and the dipping sauce is just absolutely delightful and beautiful and crunchy. The sauce, a little bit too much oil for me, but the curry sauce that sits underneath it is delicious. They can see that I've got some skill to bring, so hopefully I can stay on and bring some more. Wow, what a turnaround. What an incredible turnaround. Some really exciting chefs in this kitchen today, and I, for one, am really happy. Sam gave us a perfectly cooked stone bass. Absolutely lip-smackingly delicious. Completely unexpected. Super execution, great presentation, and that sauce was an absolute delight. Well, there's another chef I found super exciting, and that was Abinda. I thought what he did with that mackerel dish, the flavours that he brought from India, amazing. The gooseberry chutney was the star on the plate for me. I just thought it was just beautiful. So we have Arbinda and we have Sam, both going through it in the next round. We've got one more place to give. I thought that Lorena's dish was the weakest of the six today, and that's because she was up against five very strong chefs. Though it's tasty, Pigeon was slightly, you know, uh, overdone for my liking, and there's some super exciting chefs around her at the moment. George gave us a really pretty dish but it did not deliver the flavour zing I was expecting. I really enjoyed the half that sat in, in the cracker, but I didn't really like the broth that sat underneath. I've got pluses and minuses about Miranda. I didn't particularly enjoy the chicken thigh, but I do think she's quite an exciting prospect with these Caribbean flavours. It wasn't overly refined, but there were some lovely touches within the dish. I think Stu is really intriguing. I like the way he's thinking and what he's doing. I really like the way he cooked the quail. The breast was cooked perfectly for my liking. I was expecting a Thai green curry flavoured dish and I didn't get that. I think this is a beautifully cooked quail dish with the flavours and essence of Thai curry. Obviously, I've come up against some really good chefs here today. If their dishes were better on the day, I can live with that. We'll just have to wait and see. I'd be quite devastated going home today. I haven't shown my full potential. I didn't come here to go home on the first round. I think I have a chance to remain. I do.
chefs, we can only take three of you through. And boy, did you make it difficult. Some fantastic cooking. In a room of quality cooking, there were two chefs that really stood out. Sam, Arbinda, congratulations, gentlemen. I mean, top, top cooking. The third and final chef going through. is Stu. Miranda, George, Lorena, honestly, it was very, very close. Thank you, chefs. It's gutting, but I knew it from making that caramel this morning that it was going to be a real push to get through. I'm proud of what I have achieved. It's um, an experience that I will, you know, forever treasure. Obviously, I would like to go a little bit further. But, like, come on, the contestants today, were, they were amazing. It's such a great feeling to get through. My heart was in my throat a little bit, and I was kind of thinking, you know, this, this is it, I'm going out in the first round, but no, I'm happy, really happy. Today's been horrendous and brilliant all at the same time. I'm thoroughly looking forward to the opportunity to, uh, to do some pastry work that um, I'm actually comfortable with. I really want to, you know, shout loud and, you know, jump up and down. <laughs> uh, just holding my emotions. So, looking forward to the next round. Then. Next time, it's the quarter final. And the best chefs return to prove they have what it takes. A real triumph. I think this is fantastic. Those who deliver will earn the right to cook for the critics. This is an ambitious, intelligent, beautifully put together dish. <laughs>